Well, hello, Faith family. Are you glad to be in church today? Anybody? Well, you look great. Turn to your neighbor and say, you're looking awesome today. You guys are in the right place. Tell them, I love what you've done with your hair. It, it just, if they don't have any hair, just say it anyways. Just say it anyway. I want to welcome all of our guests that are here with us for the first time. We're so honored that you're here. And our team is delighted to serve you in any way possible to make your, your experience with us more enjoyable. We want to serve you well. And our prayer is, is that, that you would experience the love of God, the presence of God. And hopefully you'll, you'll meet some amazing people because the best people in all the world are a part of this family at Faith Family. So, uh, so glad you're here. And to our online audience, you may be watching at work, you're at home, you're traveling, maybe you're not feeling well today. Uh, whatever the reason, we're so glad that you're, you're worshiping with us. We want to encourage you to come out in person. We think it's a little bit better uh, live when you're in the room, but we're so glad that you're worshiping. Come on, church family. Can we give our guests and our online audience a good hand clap today? Is there anybody excited about Easter next Sunday? Woo! It is the Super Bowl of Christianity. The biggest week coming up, we will start celebrating on Saturday, two services right here at our Baytown location, and then four in Baytown, uh, the, the normal service times on Sunday, and then we've got two at Crosby. So uh, I know you've been hearing uh, the challenge that we've issued to invite a friend. It's a great time to invite someone to the house of God. Come on, let's make it a big weekend. Come on, let's celebrate the greatest day in human history. Let's celebrate it well, huh? I'm fired up about it. Getting some extra sleep, taking my vitamins, sleeping, I mean, all of that, stretching. Come on, I'm stretching. I'm getting ready. <laughs> Come on, let's get ready. Let's prepare our hearts too. Uh, it's going to be a great weekend. So next Sunday is Resurrection Sunday, but this Sunday is what we as believers call Palm Sunday, also called the Triumphal Entry. What is that? I'm glad you asked. It is the day and the moment that Jesus rode into the city of Jerusalem for the last time prior to his crucifixion and resurrection, and it kickstarts what we call Holy Week or, or Passion Week. And today I want to unpack what happened in that moment because, because it is so powerful. What happened when Jesus entered the city? And I want to talk about how we as his followers or as people in general, whether you're a follower of Jesus yet or not, if you're not, you'll have an opportunity to become one before we leave here today. But how should we respond when Jesus shows up in our lives? That's what we're going to learn about today. You guys ready for the word? Come on, let's give God praise for His Word. Matthew chapter 21. It's the first book in your New Testament. You can open up your Bibles. If you do not have your Bibles, we have all of the verses on the screens. If you have the church app, uh, all of the notes are there as well. Let's read together. Matthew 21, verse 1. As Jesus and His followers were coming closer to Jerusalem, they stopped at Bethphage at the hill called the Mount of Olives. And from there... Jesus sent two of his followers and said to them, go to the town you, see, you can see there. And when you enter it, you will quickly find a donkey tied there with its colt. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks you why you are taking the donkey, say that the master needs them and he will send them at once. This was to bring about what the prophet had said. Which prophet? Zechariah. He had lived 450 to 500 years before Christ. And this was the prophecy he uttered. Uh, he said, tell the people of Jerusalem, your king is coming to you. He is gentle and riding on a donkey, on the colt of a donkey. And the followers went and did what Jesus told them to do. And they brought the donkey and, their col and the colt and to Jesus and laid their coats on them. And Jesus sat on them. Many people spread their coats on the road. Others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the people were walking ahead of Jesus and behind him. And they were shouting, Hosanna, praise to the son of David. 
God bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise to God in heaven. Verse 10, when Jesus entered Jerusalem, all the city was filled with excitement. The people asked, who is this man? And the crowd said, this man is Jesus. Come on, say that name with me today. Jesus, the prophet from the town of Nazareth in Galilee. So much going on here. This is such a powerful moment. All four gospel writers include this in their writings. And if you look at the gospels, 20 to 40% of their writings dealt with the, the, the final week of Jesus' earthly ministry because they knew that everything hinged on Calvary because his death was, it was so, it was so important. It, it meant everything to his mission that he came to fulfill. So they tell about this, Jesus making a grand entrance into the big city. Now, there's an art to making a grand entrance. I mean, you don't want to be too early. Come on, you don't want to be too late. Anybody got a family member that's always making that grand entrance way too late? <laughs> like, well, uh, we, you know which one I'm talking about too. Probably your mama, always late. Showing up like, you know, finger pistols at everybody. Like, hey, you know, I said, girl, get in here and sit down. We're trying to eat. I'm waiting on you. Have you been to a wedding recently? They, they do a grand entrance at the wedding. It's kind of a new thing. I, uh, I enjoy it. I think it's great where they take the wedding party outside and then, you know, everybody's seated and they, they have every, you know, every member of the party coming through the doors, they introduce them, and then they, they, they get ready for that grand moment, the grand entrance of the bride and groom, the new couple. You know, Karen and I didn't get that. You know, back in, when we got married 22 years ago, they didn't, they didn't have that. It was just like we just walked into the fellowship hall through a side door. No one even cared that we showed up. <laughs> they were just there for the cake and the mints, those mints that just kind of melt in your mouth. How many know what I'm talking about? Some nasty sherbet punch, you know, that's all we had. Hey, y'all, y'all doing it right now. They're like, ladies and j- 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 gentlemen, get on your feet. And everybody's, and then the hype music hits, right? And, 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 the, and the bride and the groom come in. Sometimes, you know, they try to make it creative. They want to piggyback, you know, and the bride's carrying the groom in. Because <laughs> he, 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 he was a little guy, you know, he could, anyway. <laughs> The groom, sometimes he's making it rain. He's with money, you know. He's throwing that money around. And I'm like, bro, that's the most money you'll ever going to have. I'm telling you, right? It's all downhill from here, bro. Dad, y'all make that grand entrance at Home Depot. Y'all know it. Y'all, y'all walking in there like you own the joint. Saturday morning Crocs and socks, you know. You geared up. Got your cargo shorts down to your calves, you know, with 13,000 pockets, because you might, you never know, you might need to put a tool here, something there, and you walk around ordering people around, and and you pass up the little shopping cart that everybody else gets, that's a weak sauce dad's, (laughs) you get in that big cart, you know, knocking people over with it, you just need a box of screws, but you walking in there like, (laughs) I need some help on aisle five, you follow me, grand entrance, Jesus is making a grand entrance. It was all set up. It was all choreographed. It was planned. He had planned this moment. Lots of fanfare. There was a portion of the crowd that had followed him from Bethany. You know what he did at Bethany? He, he had raised Lazarus from the dead. A brother had been dead for four days. Miracles. Been studying those miracles this month. And this, and this crowd knew this isn't an ordinary guy. This is a miracle worker. This is the Messiah, the one we've been waiting on. Now, most of his ministry, he had avoided the limelight. Jesus stayed away from the big city. Maybe he's more of a small town guy. But he had now gone into the big city, which normally Jerusalem had a population of about 600,000 people. Pretty big city. But at this moment, it was... The, it was packed. The, the population had swelled to two and a half million people. What was everybody there for? The Feast of Passover. 
It's a big deal. And the Romans had built these major highways, easy to travel. So Jews and Gentiles, and a Gentile is anyone that's not a Jew, had come to this big party. I mean, it was, it, it was people everywhere. I mean, traffic, you know, like donkey to donkey, just traffic <laughs> all the way down their Garth Road. I mean, people getting frustrated, you know, just or the restaurants, you know, what's the wait time? An hour and a half, you know, you're like, what, an hour and a half? So people are mad. The hotels, you know, are packed. I mean, there's vendors selling T-shirts, you know, Passover party. I mean, it was just, it's a big deal. This is the moment Jesus had been waiting on, and, um, and, and he's making a grand entrance, revealing himself, finally, as the Messiah, the true king. So as he entered the city, the people were shouting, they were laying down their cloaks, they were waving palm branches, laying them on the ground. Now, this was something that they did, but they only did it in the past for a victorious king. In the Old Testament, there was a king named Jehu. They had honored him in this way. And now they're saying, they're saying Hosanna, which means save now, Lord, save now. They thought this was the moment we're about to get rid of these Romans, wear these men wearing little skirts, and we're going to throw us a Jewish party like the world ain't ever seen. The Lord's going to save us. This man's going to save us. And he would save them, but not in the way that they thought. So Jesus takes his place, the head of the parade, kind of like, I mean, think about when the Astros won the championship, you know, when they had their parade, people pressed in, trying to get a glimpse, grown men on each other's shoulders. Can you, can you see me? I, I got to see little Jose. I got to see little, I see him, I see him, I see him, there he is. No, no, that, that's just four-year-old. That's, that's, just, that's just a little dude, little, little bitty guy. <laughs> so they're, they're excited. They're worshiping him. They're celebrating him. It's electric. It, it, the atmosphere is just exciting. Now, Jesus wasn't manipulating them to get this response. No, this was just the natural response that came from a people who were seeing something that they thought they would never see. The Messiah was here. He, he's here. And Jesus, when he, when he, in this moment, right after this moment, what does he do? And say, it isn't like he's hyped. He starts crying. Like, Jesus, this is, this is your party. This is your parade. Why are you crying? And the Bible says he was crying because he knew that the people's mouths and their lips were saying the right thing, but their hearts were far from him. They didn't know who he really was. They thought he was going to be a political leader. Come in and kill the Romans establish a Jewish empire. But he was going to bring salvation in a different way. He didn't come to set up a, an empire. He could have done that, but they would still have a sin problem. They would still need forgiveness. So he said, I'm going to save you, and I'm going to do more than you think I could do. Listen, if God met every one of your expectations, he would never have a moment to exceed them. So he was doing more he was giving them more than they were even asking for, but they could not see it. His desire was to set up a kingdom in the hearts of men and women, to establish and bring the kingdom of God, to sit on the throne of every person's heart that would place their faith and their trust in him for salvation. So this crowd, they're saying, they're worshiping him. They're saying, crown him on Sunday, but on Friday, they were yelling, crucify him. Isn't that how we are when God doesn't do what we want in the way that we want it? We get all jacked up on Jesus on Sunday, but he doesn't answer our prayers in the way that we thought or do what we think he should do if he's so good. And then we've turned our hearts from Sunday to Friday. And they're missing the moment. Let's not miss the moment. So a few things about this king I want you to know. Number one, he's confrontational. Now, that's a word we don't associate with Jesus much. Compassionate, yes. Confrontational, ugh. We don't like that word because it's uncomfortable. None of us really like confrontation. But Jesus came to confront some things. He was confronting the religious 
establishment that was putting undue burden on people to connect with God. He was coming to confront the political establishment to make things right. And he acknowledges that he's the Messiah. Now in chapter 20, this is the chapter in front, on the way to Jerusalem, Jesus passed two blind men. They yelled out to him. They wanted healing. And they addressed him with a very... Oh, it was, it, was, it was a title that they used that, that could have been, uh, man, it, it could have brought Jesus a lot of heat. And, and here's what they said. They said, Lord, son of David, have mercy on us. Now, when the people heard those men yell that out to Jesus, they gasped. Because Lord meant the ultimate king. And if he's the ultimate king, then, then that means he's the Messiah. That's what the Jew thought. The Gentile said, if I call him Lord, then what's that mean? What's that do with Caesar? He's the king. So lives are in jeopardy because Jesus is saying, and he, and he, he responds to the men, and he just says, yes. In other words, he's like, yeah, that's me. Son of David, that was a term a Jew would only use, use if they were referring to the ultimate king of all kings, the Messiah. He's like, I'm that guy. The disciples hear it, and they were probably like, did you just hear that? Peter's like, John, John, did you hear Jesus? Did you hear our boy Jesus? He's finally letting everyone know. He's revealing himself as the Messiah. So they're excited but probably nervous because this is a do or die moment. Okay, the things are getting hot. Things, like Jesus is about to do something. Jesus knew what was going on. He had planned it all. He had sent two followers ahead of him say, go get that cult ready. Now, why would that be important? Because Jesus knew prophecy. Jesus knew the Torah, which is what they had, the word of God that they had at that time. He knew every prophecy that had ever been uttered about him. And he fulfilled every one. And he knew, I can't walk up into this city just on my own two feet. I got to ride a little donkey that had never been ridden before. And I think it's cool that someone loaned Jesus his donkey which lets me know that Jesus enters into a city on the generosity of everyday people. People that are looking for him. So he comes in and he goes straight to the temple. He starts rearranging furniture like someone who owned that house. But I guess it was all, it was every, everything that they were doing was pointing to him anyways. He is Jesus. He's flipping over tables. He's confrontational. And he told those religious leaders, my house is to be a house of prayer. You have turned it into a den of thieves. Confrontational. Secondly, Jesus is contradicting. He's a contradicting king. What's he coming to town on? He's riding on a donkey. Doesn't sound very kingly. You know, when a celebrity or a politician comes into a city, they'll, oftentimes they'll have like an entourage, a motorcade. I, I looked up just out of curiosity this week, how many vehicles are in a presidential motorcade? You know, here's the answer. I would have never known it. 40 to 50. But there's no doubt which one is the president. He in that limo, that, that stretched out Cadillac. Coming in there with the flags. They're blocking off streets. There's a ported person coming into town. Big to do. Big to do. And if I were one of Jesus' disciples, I'd be like, hey, Jesus, we can't be coming in on a donkey. We got to get you a limo. If it was modern day, I'd be like, Jesus, we're getting a limo. I saw this Lambo limo we could rent for a day. That's all we need it for. We're coming in strong. We're making a statement. But maybe you're a little redneck. <laughs> and you're like, we're going to get you an F-350 dually, and we're going to trick it out. <laughs> we're going to trick that thing out. And if you got a little gangster in you, and you're a little gangster redneck, I've met some gangster rednecks. And you're like, 
always have to do a double take because they, like, they got that thing lowered a little bit, you know. So, so maybe that would be more your cup of tea. Jesus, he didn't, he didn't choose that. He chose the equivalent to like a go-kart that's been under, sitting under a tarp, you know, in your, in your grand, behind your grandpa's shed. You know, it's like, he's like, I'm just, I just, I'm good with the donkey. I'm good with the donkey. It's not, he, he, he comes humble. Did you see that? He, come, he didn't come in like Caesar came into a city through the western gate. They believe that maybe that same day Caesar came in on, in the western gate on a steed, on a horse, representing the might and the strength and the, and of Rome that would impose its will on you. Jesus comes in through the eastern gate on a donkey. Jesus does not impose his will on you. Oh, he could. But if he forced you to choose him, if he forced you to love him, it wouldn't be love. And he gives you and I the choice to welcome him into our lives. He comes humble. So he comes on a donkey. And any king that rides in on a donkey is one that's going to get slaughtered. You know, king riding into war on a donkey, you're going to put your faith in. Uh, no, but he came to be slaughtered, to give his life, fulfilling prophecy. He comes gentle. He comes as a servant. Philippians 2 says he gave up his place with God and made himself nothing. He became a man, became a ser- like a servant, and when he was living as a man, he humbled himself and was fully obedient to God. Come on, that's, that's courage, to, to, to ride into a city knowing what awaits you. Could have taken a U-turn on that little donkey. <laughs> that's what we would have done. So anybody thinks Jesus is weak, you, you're not talking about my Jesus. You know, when I watch TV, you know, shows and maybe a documentary or a movie about Jesus, I'm always wondering, are they going to give me the manly Jesus or are they going to give me the weak sauce Jesus? You know, one that's all pale. <laughs> Look like he ain't eaten in four days, you know, four, four, 40 days, you know. Behold. I'm like, behold, I'm changing the channel. This is, <laughs> man, no, that ain't Jesus. He's strong. He's a carpenter. He's a man's man. You know, God created men to be men. But a great example of what it means to be a strong man, to be a strong leader. Jesus said, I'm going right in here, and I'm going to humble, I'm going to be a servant. He knew that his death would pay the price that you and I could never pay. And he rescued us from the power and the bondage of sin when we could not free ourselves. He came as a servant to make things right. The third thing I see about this king is he is a coming king. This is what I get excited. I get excited about this because when the king shows up, things turn around. As Christians, we believe Jesus came back to life from the dead. We'll be talking about more of that, obviously, next week. But everywhere a king goes, he brings his, he brings his authority, his dominion, his power, his provision. And what Matthew tells us is that the king is coming to you. It's present tense. It's personal. Jesus is coming to you even today. He's coming. And when he shows up in your life, that's where breakthrough happens. That's when prayers get answered. That's when dreams come true. He brings his healing, his forgiveness, his deliverance. All that we need, he brings it into our life. He brings us a new power. Why? Because he's king of all. Not only does he come to us now, he's coming again to planet Earth very soon, someday. It could happen right now. I'd be just fine with that. I mean, if you ain't ready, y'all have to get someone else up here to just finish the message because I'm gone. You got to tell me twice. I'm ready right now. I'm ready right now. Let's go. And uh, nothing scares me. I- I'm ready to go. He's coming back. Just like he said, for people that are looking for him. Psalm 24 speaks of how we should be looking to this, our king. Lift up your heads, you gates. Be lifted up, you ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Come on, I'm looking for him to come. And when he shows up for the next time, 
He ain't coming on a donkey. (laughs) Book of Revelation tells us that he's coming back on a supernatural white horse. He's going to come back and he's going to wage war on the enemies of God. Anytime you think, how could people live the way they're living right now? How could society spit in God's face? Hey, listen, he's given everybody a chance to get right. And one day he's coming back and he's going to he, he just gonna do work. The Bible says a sword's going to come out of his mouth. And he's going to destroy the enemies of God. It's going to happen. Book of Revelation says, I saw heaven op- standing open and there before me was a white horse whose rider is faithful and true, talking about Jesus. And on his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written. I guess Jesus got a tattoo right there. (laughs) It says, King of kings and Lord of lords. Come on, church, let's clap. We We got a king that's alive. He's victorious. He's coming again. So what do we do when Jesus shows up in our lives? Three things. Number one, we should worship him. When the king shows up, we should worship him. The crowds were worshiping. The religious leaders said, Jesus, hey, you need to tell your people to play the quiet game. And Jesus said, I could try. But even if I made them quiet, the rocks would cry out. What a strange thing to say. The rocks. Rocks can't talk. He's like, if I tell these people to be quiet, they can talk. But even if they couldn't talk and they were to be quiet, the rocks would have to say something. Rocks can't talk, but if they could tell a story, maybe a few of them would go like this. Maybe the rock that Moses led the children of Israel to that water came out of when they were thirsty, that rock might say, God will revive you and refresh you in a dry place. Maybe one of the stones that Joshua was instructed by God to tell the people to get 12 stones out of that river Jordan that we just crossed and now we're going into the promised land, set up a memorial to remember what God has done. Maybe one of those stones would say, when you don't know the next step, just take it, take it anyway, take it in faith because God's going to take you somewhere you never thought you could go. Maybe the stone that David used when he took down that giant, might say to us, there's no giant in your life that's bigger than the power of your God. He's bigger. He brings victory. Maybe one of the rocks that Nehemiah used to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem may say, use your life to build something for God. Build something for God. In spite of the difficulty, build something for God. Maybe one of the stones that was supposed to be used to kill the woman that was caught in an act of adultery might say, Jesus can forgive every sin and cleanse every mistake that you've ever made. He'll give you a fresh start. (laughs) Next week, we're talking about a stone, the one that was rolled away. It might say to us, Jesus is alive. He's not here anymore. Come on, let him live in you. I don't know. Rocks can't talk, though. You can. You were made to worship God. It's in you. It's hardwired in you. I see it all the time. Yesterday, I was watching the final four. Anybody watching the final four right now? Anybody? If you're not, well, it's something that basketball, it's college basketball, and it's a tournament. It's called March Madness, even though it's not really in March anymore because we're now April 2nd, but it culminates at the final four. 64 teams come down to four, and then to two, and then the national champion. So I'm watching it. And I don't have a dog in the hunt right now. I'm not a fan of really either team, but I love watching the fans of the teams playing. And, you know, it's just, it just comes naturally. These, these people, you know, they, their team, you know, maybe one of the players throws down just a nasty dunk. I mean, it's just like, boom, or they hit a three-pointer. The people all stand up, and they make a lot of noise. And they start looking, and they don't care how they look. They're like, yeah! Woo! They lift their hands. They're clapping. They're high-fiving. They're chest. I mean, it's just natural. It's just natural. No one has to prompt them. Okay, guys, he just made a dunk. It's a dunk. <laughs> um, let's, let's all clap now. And they're like, yes, yes, what a great. I really like the form. 
this is the way the game should be played. All the passes, all the passes, no selfishness. It's wonderful. No, it just, boom, it just happens. It's natural. You're made to worship. I was at a, I was at a Chris Stapleton concert the other day. Don't judge me. And we're sitting there, and about the third, we're, we're at the rodeo, and about the third song, I look over at Kara. I said, it's about to happen. And she's like, what? What's going to happen? I said, just watch. It started happening. Some people started standing up. And we were all seated, but some people started standing up. It's usually a woman. <laughs> it's usually a woman. And, and they start kind of swaying back and forth. You see them. From the back, and they're swaying back and forth. <laughs> Maybe they got a little extra courage from the the the, the liquids, the beverages that they've been. <laughs> as soon as they walked in, they went straight to the stand, and you know they've been staying hydrated, and they're they're over there. Come on, how many you know what I'm talking about? Y'all can see this woman right now. Probably got a little mid-drift on, a little, little, little beer gut hanging out. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so I'm watching all this, and then a friend stands up next to her, you know, because they always, they always roll together. You know, they, they're always rolling together. Got their girlfriend over there, ride or die, and they're, they're over there. And usually the next girl will turn around and look at everybody. He's like, come on. Got their arms awkwardly in the air, just waving them around, you know. And, 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 I, and I'm watching Kara. And then everybody starts singing with them. Everybody starts singing. And, and if, I, if I started the song, many of you would know it. Everybody's singing this song in unison. Nobody was saying, come on, guys, let's really, let's enter in. Let's all sing together, one voice. No, people are just doing it. And you know what I thought? Great worship. Wrong object. Wrong object. And, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with going to a concert as long as, you know, it's like, I'm not talking about a crazy concert, you know, some of them. But, or a game or enjoying this. I, I, I'm just saying no one else can take the place. We can't lift up anyone else higher than we're lifting up Jesus. You were made to worship God. And listen to this. Don't waste your worship. We can say one thing. We worship God with our lips, but our hearts and our lives tell a different story. Because we're worshiping money and pleasure. We're worshiping things of this world, materialism. And we're giving ourselves. Listen, everything about our life should be worshiped to God. Not just songs. You know, it's interesting, I, I, but, but our lifestyle, the way that I treat my wife, the way I lead my family, the way I work, it's all worship to God. The way I handle my finances, it's all worship to God. It's like, God, I'm just, you're, you're worthy. You're worthy. They're laying down cloaks. They're waving branches. The religious people say, hey, tell them, be quiet. Every time there's worship, there's always whining. That's why people can come to a church like this, and we try to put Jesus at the center of the parade. He's the, he's the star of the show. I, I, I'm, I'm not. No one on this stage. No, no name of a church. It, it isn't about us. Come on, we try to make it about Jesus. And that's why when we come in, we sing about Jesus. Come on, we talk about Jesus. We teach about Jesus. We're always pointing people to Jesus. Not me. Look over there. That's Jesus. We're talking about him. And there'll be people in a room like this worshiping God. And there'll be people in a room like this saying, why is it so loud in here? Oh, why do they have the lights? Are they trying to be like a concert or something up in here? Like, what's up with that? I think God just likes dark, just, you know, all the lights on, beige walls, people on the stage that can't sing. Why don't they sing the songs like we used to sing when I was a kid? Hey, you had your time. We sang those songs. I know them maybe probably better than you. I don't even need the hymnal anymore. But every generation has a new sound. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with the old songs. They bless me. I love to sing them to this day. We'll work them in from time to time. But there's always a new sound. But listen, you can have worship and whining in the same room. 
Come on, let's be worshipers of God. Let's be people that just open to God, that just lifting up the name of Jesus. Not living for pleasure, not living for possessions, not living for the things of this world. But we're, we're reaching out to him because John 4 says the Father's looking for people to worship him in spirit and in truth. Is your worship real? Are you worshiping Jesus for who he is or just what you want him to do to, for you and give to you? Are you the one on Sunday that's saying crown him and you're the one that's saying on Friday crucify him? Is your worship authentic? Is it real? Are you worshiping him truly for who he is? Secondly, you surrender to him. You worship him, you surrender to him. Jesus started flipping tables over. Why? Because he comes to rearrange things. There is no building that's the temple anymore. The scripture tells us in the new covenant, you are the temple of the Holy Spirit. God's spirit doesn't live in a building anymore. It lives in you if you're a child of God. And when you invite Jesus in, you say, rearrange whatever you want to rearrange. He turned, listen, he will turn your life upside down. He doesn't come to ride along with you. He comes to drive, and he says, you get in the back seat, and I'll take your life places you never thought it could go. Only happens when you surrender. Every part, listen, every part, my relationships, my family, my work, my money, I don't have, I'm not the ultimate authority of anything in my life. Jesus is. Jesus, what do you want me to do? And you know how much peace that brings you, knowing that you ain't got to make all the decisions? You know how much peace it makes, brings when you don't have to provide because the king always provides for his kingdom. So, so now he's telling me what to do. He's leading me on the inside by the Holy Spirit what to say. I don't get stressed out as the pastor of this church. It isn't my church. It's Jesus' church. And if I just listen and slow down and get quiet, he'll tell me, hey, I want you to do this. Take the people here, to lead the people here. Listen, this is what they need. You, and and it, makes, it makes it so much easier. Some of you are striving. You know why you're stressed out? Because you're trying to be God. You're trying to be king of your own life. You're trying to be responsible for things that you cannot control. You don't know the end from the beginning. Only God knows the end from the beginning. Only he knows everything that's ahead of you. We, we want him to tell us. He said, I'm only going to tell you one step at a time. Come on, we're following the king. That's why we pray like Jesus wants us to pray. Your kingdom come. Your will be done. On the night before he was crucified, he was in the garden, and he was sweating, got great drops of blood. The pressure was so much. And he said, Father, not my will, but your will be done. She feels it, and I feel it too. It's our surrender to God that brings us the most freedom. You think you're free because you can do whatever you want whenever you want to do it. That's bondage. Sin will take you right into bondage. True freedom is found when you are empowered by the power of the Holy Spirit, living your life for Christ. Every decision, every major decision, every part of your life. Jesus, come over here and flip over some tables. He was doing it because they had made religion into this thing that they were using God. The people were using God instead of letting God use them. Third thing is what some of you are going to do today for the very first time. You crown him. You crown him as Lord of your life. Jesus was making a statement. Crown me or kill me. He's still making the same statement today. I mean, the outrageous claims that he made to be the son of God. I mean, I'm the son of God. He, he let people call him that? Well, because of that, there could be only three conclusions you can draw from that. He is either a liar or a lunatic or he truly is Lord. And as far as I know, he's the only one that predicted his own death and resurrection and it all happened just like he said it would. So I'm going with option three. Like he is Lord. And one day, all of us 
either on this side of eternity or the other side. You want to do it on this side of eternity, according to the book of Philippians chapter 2, is that every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess what? That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. That's going to happen someday. Friend, hey, friend, listen, you want to do it on this side of eternity. The other side is going to be done, but it's too late. On this side, Jesus, I crown you in my life. I crown you. Well, Josh, I kind of think this is getting kind of radical. Listen, Jesus, when he came into Jerusalem, he said, listen, I am who I am. Deal with it. He's like, I ain't changing. He's faithful. He's true. We do the changing. Only when his power is at work in us. How do you crown him? Well, this is not in your notes, but writer of 1 Corinthians said, no, one, no man can call Jesus Lord unless the Holy Spirit lead him to do that. Here's what I know. The Holy Spirit's talking to some of you right now. You see, God uses foolish people like me. He calls it the foolish, like this preaching thing. To share things with you that your heart needs to hear. And the Holy Spirit, he'll, he'll, he'll use these inarticulate words that I use and he'll, he'll craft them and he'll get them to you in the way you need to hear it. And, and what he's doing is he's knocking at the door of your heart right now, Jesus says. And he's like, are you going to let me come in? How do I make Jesus Lord? Romans chapter 10 tells us if you be- declare with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Saved from what? Saved from sin. Saved from hell. Saved from destruction. Saved from sickness. Saved from poverty. Saved from addictions. Saved from inferiority. Saved from anxiety. Saved from everything that the devil's tried to put on your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for Jesus. We give you praise, God. Jesus, we acknowledge you as king. The king of all kings. Today, we we ask you, Holy Spirit, Lord, to challenge us. So that we might invite you to come in and rearrange our lives as we submit to your lordship. Jesus, you don't just come to save. You come to call the shots. You come to be Lord. So we position ourselves under your love and your grace and your authority today. And Lord, it's easy to love you back. Because you first loved us. You loved us when we didn't deserve your love. When we were living lives that weren't worthy of your love. But God, you gave it anyways because your love's unconditional. So Lord, you gave it all for us. And today, by faith, we give all that we are back to you. Have your way, Holy Spirit. Maybe you're here and you say, Josh, I've never made a decision to follow Christ, to have a real relationship with Him. Today's that day. Today's, today is the moment that God set up. While you were even in your mother's womb, God, did what God had planned this day out for some of you. If you're here and you say, Josh, I'm unsure about my eternal future. Today I want to know that heaven's my home, that I'm a child of God. I'd love to pray for you. If that's you, on the count of three, just lift your hand high so I know who I'm praying for. One, two, three, all over this place. Hold it up. Make sure that you're sure and make the devil mad because he just lost another one. Thank you, Lord. Put your hand on your heart. Say this prayer in faith with me. Say, dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. I believe he's your son. He He died on the cross. And he rose from the dead. Jesus Christ, come into my life. 
I repent of my sins. I make you my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for loving me. Today I choose to follow you. In your name I pray. Amen. Come on, church. Can we clap for those that prayed that prayer today? Thank you for joining us at Faith Family Church Online. If God is using this ministry to impact your life, we encourage you to share your story with us at info at myfaithfamily.org. If you would like to partner with us financially and help us expand the reach of our church and the good news of Jesus, you can click on the Give button located at the top of the page, or you can give by texting FFC Give to the number 77977. Again, thank you so much for joining us. We hope that you're encouraged by today's message.